welcome everyone to this wonderful evening. We're all looking forward to it on the sacred ecology of India. I must first begin by welcoming and thanking a very, very old friend, Dr. Nandita Krishna, to have agreed so spontaneously to give us this lecture virtually. Dr. Nandita is no stranger to the Museum Society. She has lectured us on many occasions in the past in the old traditional way of coming to the visitor center and addressing us. <clears throat> As you all know, this last one year has been quite a challenge and I think we've all risen to the occasion rather well. And uh, Nandita, we have given more than I think 40 webinars so far over the last, uh, what should I say, 370, 75 days. And so, so happy to welcome you on behalf of the chairman and trustees of the CSMBS, on behalf of Dr. Sabiasachi Mukherjee, our director general, on behalf of all the members and guests who are present here today to attend this evening's function. I know some people had a little bit of difficulty, but I think we're all coming in. So I will just say a few opening remarks. And I think by then we'll all be in. We've got people joining us from literally all over the country. I was following it a little earlier. And welcome Subhu from Chennai. I'm so glad that you have been able to join this seminar. You are a friend of the museum, like so many of us, and indeed a friend of Nandita and her family and myself. A few words about Dr. Nandita. She's a historian, environmentalist, educationist, and a writer based in Chennai. Nandita has a PhD in ancient Indian culture from my alma mater from our city, Bombay University, where she was also a Hera scholar. She has been a professor and research guide for the PhD program of CPR Institute of Indological Research affiliated to the University of Madras. She was the honorary director from 1981 of the CPR Miswami Iyer Foundation and was elected president in 2013. It's amazing that Nandita has restored 53 sacred groves in Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka and revived the traditional water tanks in eight villages. She has written 23 best-selling non-fiction books, including Groves and Gods of Tamil Nadu for ICHR, a prominent book referred to by many scholars and many others who are non-scholars as well. A few words about this evening's lecture. The wisdom of ancient India recognized the importance of nature and natural resources. Every aspect of the environment was regarded as sacred, whether it was plants, animals, mountains, forests, rivers, water bodies, and sometimes even entire cities. It is a very apt subject that Nandita has selected for today's lecture. As we are threatened by problems like global warming and climate change. And it behoves us to recapture those ancient traditions which protected the environment through several millenniums. A very important award that the Institute has received under Nandita's able stewardship, the CPR Environmental Education Center received the Indira Gandhi Paryavaran Purishkar India's highest environmental award under her directorship in 2000. Nandita, we are delighted to welcome you and we are all looking forward to your lecture this evening. But before I hand you over to the technical team, I would like to thank our technical team without whom we could not conduct these webinars. They are a young team from your alma mater, St. Xavier's College, under the able leadership of Professor Jason John, our Honorary Secretary. And he is aided and helped by Rachel, Ami, Natasha, Rochelle, and Yashrad. 
thank you all. You have been an absolute pillar of support to us. And I, Museum Society, really, really appreciate the voluntary work you do for us. So now I hand you over to the ABLE technical team and welcome Anita and welcome all our visitors this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for Rosa. It's wonderful to be back in Bombay, even if it's in Mumbai, even if it's virtually. And earlier I saw St. Xavier's College and the museum. They looked absolutely lovely and made me so nostalgic. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to thank the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, Vastu Sangrahale, and the Museum Society of M Mumbai especially Ms. Dr. Feroza Godrej, who is an old schoolmate and college mate of mine, and Jason John and his team, who have worked very hard to make this technically feasible. I chose the subject sacred ecology, which is a very important subject today because whether we are talking about climate change, which is hitting us, or even the pandemic, which has changed our lives, all these are a result of poor environmental management. And I wanted to talk about how India preserved, protected its environment over 5,000 years without laws, without rules, and just through the help, the screen of religion. It was a tradition. It was a tradition well kept. And it's a tradition still, which still exists today among subaltern so it's a group subaltern societies and villages in Tamil Nadu where I live Chennai um, every village has its sacred grove or Koval card as it is called and it's not just Tamil Nadu it's all over India it's amazing how this basic religion of uh, worshipping mother goddesses worshipping nature trees plants animals and so on is all inclusive is all Indian. It, is, it does not belong to any one state. And this makes really makes you feel that this is the Indianness that we are talking about. So I shall go on to my presentation now. You're not going to see my face right through. I'm going to show you a I'm going to show you a presentation which will take you right through 5,000 years of history, literally from the Indus Valley through the Vedic period and right down to today. So my topic today is the sacred ecology of India. And what is the sacred ecology? Traditionally, the Indian housewife does so many things which we do not really associate with the environment, but she is managing her environment. For example, she decorates her doorway with either Rangoli in Maharashtra, Kolam in the south, Alpana in Bengal. It has different names in different parts of the country. And what is this? This is made out of rice flour. And why, why does she use this rice flour? For two reasons. One is to feed the ants and small insects with rice flour. The second, it's also a form of pest control because the ants get enough to feed outside her door. So they don't come into the kitchen and then she doesn't have to spray pest pesticides in the kitchen. So this is an excellent form of environmental management. Unfortunately, today the rice flour is mixed with chemical colors and rock powder and things like that. So the ants come into your kitchen. The housewife waters the tulsi plant, which is inside the open courtyard of a house. And why does she do that? To prevent coughs, colds, fevers. That is the first sign of uh, COVID-19, as you know. And possibly the Tulsi plant kept away so many illnesses which we know nothing about. She prays that her bath water, when she, before bathing, she prays that her bath water may be as sacred as the river Ganga's water. Before, of course, it was polluted, which we have done so well, polluting the river. But the Ganga has proven antimicrobial properties and such water again protects her. She circumambulates the pipal tree. This is a ritual that binds the Indus, Vedic, 
Hindu Buddhist Jain traditions, the people releases oxygen day and night, the only plant which does so. Finally, she feeds the crows. Every meal she is supposed to put out a little food for the crows and why? So that the crows will keep the outer environment clean. They are scavengers. So everything she does is a part of environmental management. So every aspect of her life is intimately connected to nature and the natural environment and scientific environmental management especially. It's carried out in the name of religion because as you know in India, if you say something is scientific or good for you, they won't do it. But if you say you'll get a few good karmas, of course it will be done. Unfortunately, all that was good and preserved in the name of culture and tradition has been discarded in the name of modernization and development. However, many of our ancient traditions, environmental traditions are still preserved in rural India. And it's amazing how these how common these traditions are from Kashmir to Kanyakumari or from Dwarka to Dibrugarh. Environmental protection is dharma, the law of righteousness. The basis of Hindu, Buddhist and Jain culture is dharma or righteousness, incorporating duty, cosmic law and justice. It is sanatan or eternal, for it is without beginning or end and it supports the whole universe. Every person must act for the general welfare of the earth, for humanity, for all creation and all aspects of life. The Mahabharata says that dharma is meant for the well-being of all living creatures. Hence that by which the welfare of living creatures is sustained, that for sure is dharma. The sacred ecology of India is thus appropriately placed to take on contemporary concerns like deforestation, water shortages, intensive farming of animals which has led to this pandemic and global warming, all of which are closely causing climate change. Now let's start with this seal. It's something we have all seen. It's a male figure inside a pipal tree, a highly stylized pipal tree. Now this male figure is possibly a yaksha. There is a worshipper kneeling in front of him and behind him is a ram, maybe it was to be sacrificed. Below him are seven men, the Saptarishi. This is the oldest scene of worship in Indian archaeology. The tree was the object of worship. Till now we have never seen a scene of worship and this is the first time that in archaeology we are seeing worship and it is the worship of the tree. And the worship of the pipal tree and other trees also continues even today. Now this is a scene of a pipal tree or, uh, beneath which there is the village chopal, the public space where people sit and talk and have meetings and women are circumambulating this tree. This is done every day all over India. Now this is yet another scene. You'll see many of these scenes, a female figure seated on a tree. And this tree has been identified as the Kejarli, called the Shami in the Vedas. And there is below her a tiger. So who is this? In the Vedas, the Pipal and the Shami, which are regarded as male and female, the twigs of these two trees were rubbed against each other to produce the sacred sacrificial fire. I'm talking about a time when there were no matchboxes to light a fire. Much later, Kejarli also became the sacred tree of the Bishnois of Rajasthan. <clears throat> but it's very interesting that the Tamil text, the Tolkapiam, mentions that Kotrave or Durga was the goddess of the desert. And there are no deserts in Tamil Nadu. So how did they know? The tiger was her vehicle, like Durga's and Shakti. She is, can be on a lion or a tiger. And the prickly Kotra no Kejarli, which it has been identified with the Kejarli, was a plant. In fact, Kotran, she is named Kotrave after the plant. Now, interestingly, this is probably the time when the Saraswati went underground and Rajasthan became a desert. And the Kejarli or the Shami has been sacred from then, from 5000 years ago in the Indus Valley period to today, right through the Vedic period and so on. So there is a continuity in Indian civilization. Here you have another stylized people. Here you have another Kejarli above a Chaupal. 
The third seal is a three-headed male figure in yogic position with pipal leaves above his head. Is it a deity? Possibly Shiva. So the sages of the Rig Veda showed a clear appreciation of nature, of the natural world and its ecology, the importance of the environment and the management of natural resources. The Rig Veda dedicates a whole rim to him to the rivers, the Nadi Stuti Sukta, and the Atharva Veda uh, uh, dedicates the hymn to the, uh, the Prithvi Sukta, consisting of 63 stanzas in praise of Mother Earth and nature and human dependence on the nature. And the Brihadaranyaka Upanishads, I'm not quoting any Sanskrit over here because not everybody would understand it, says, in the beginning, there was the self alone. He transformed himself into man and woman. Later, he transformed himself into other creatures, bipeds and quadrupeds. This way, he created everything that exists on earth, in water and in the sky. He realized, I indeed am creation, for I produced all this. Thence arose creation. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, I am the earth, I am the water, I am the air. And the environment is sacred because it is the Lord himself. In the Vedas, nature was part of an indivisible force uniting the world of humans, animals and plants. Natural phenomena express the principles that govern the world and the cosmic order, Rita. Prakriti, we know Prakriti as nature, but it actually means placing before or at first. It is the original or natural form or condition of anything, original or primary substance. That is Prakriti. While Purusha is the masculine aspect of creation, Prakriti is the feminine. Prakriti is dynamic, causing change, the primal motive force, an essential part of the universe and the basis of all creation. Hinduism has a definite code of environmental ethics. Humans may not consider themselves above nature, nor can they claim to rule over other forms of life. Hence, traditionally, the Hindu attitude has been respectful towards nature. Now, when I say Hindu, I do not mean Hindus as people. I mean Hindu texts, which they would have followed long ago and which if they followed today, we wouldn't find ourselves in the predicament we are in. There is another very important aspect to this, the Pancha Mahabhuta. The primordial or cosmic matter of nature is made up of five elements, earth, air, fire or energy, water and space, which are better known as the Pancha Mahabhuta. Their proper balance and harmony are essential for the well-being of humankind and the maintenance of this harmony is a dharma or righteous duty. Now I want to show you this beautiful miniature which is the family of Shiva, Shiva, Parvati, Ganesha, Kartikeya and all their animals. Biological diversity is exemplified by the family and habitat of Shiva, Parvati and their two sons. Shiva's habitat is Mount Kailasha with snowy peaks representing the cosmic heavens. The stream of Ganga water from the hair on his head indicates the purity and importance of water. Nandi the bull represents the animals who help humans. Durga's lion represents wildlife. The peacock represents the avian species. The mouse and serpent represent small and hidden animals. In Shiva's household, natural enemies live in harmony with each other. Or as it is said in the Bible, the lion and the lamb sleep beside each other. The family of Shiva, Lord Shiva, represents the coexistence and is influenced by the concept of ecological harmony and respect for biological diversity. I'm just going to uh, repeat this in Jainism and Buddhism, which have the same traditions. Jainism believes all life is interdependent, hence ahimsa or non-violence towards all is the supreme virtue. <coughs> Excuse me. This earth is our dwelling, our temple, a sangha, a vessel in which spiritual attainment can be perfected. As all life is interconnected, mutual coexistence is the mantra 
for sustainable living. Buddhism says this entire world should be protected. This entire world, though apparently divided, is undivided in its interconnection. Nature is a part of a continuum of interbeing. Buddha attained enlightenment seated under a pipal tree in the Uruvela forest. He gave his first sermon in the deer park at Sarna. Hence trees, forests and gardens are sacred to Buddhism. In fact, in Jainism, each Tirthankara is represented by a plant and an animal. And in Buddhism, of course, the forests and trees and gardens are very sacred. And all the early monasteries were situated deep in forests. Coming back to Tamil tradition, Tamil Sangam literature describes the Aindatine, the fivefold division of, of the geographical landscape, each with its own flower, tree, pl animal, plant, and deity. And what are these five Tine? They are the Kurinji of forests, presided over by Murugan of Kartikeya, Mulle, pasture land, whose reigning deity was Krishna, Maradam, agricultural land ruled over by Indra, Natal, coastal regions, the world of Varuna. Now, these four are a part of modern Tamil Nadu too. We go back to Pale, the desert, the wasteland, which of course today there's wasteland in Tamil Nadu also, but the time this was written, there would not have been wastelands. And the Pale is the region of the goddess Kotrave, who is Durga. Now, where is the sacred ecology today? It has not gone. The sacred forests of ancient India are today sacred groves. The sacred gardens of ancient India are today Nandavanams of temples. The sacred trees are the Sthalavrikshas, rivers, you know, the Tebri River is sacred, water bodies, temple tanks, animals, mountains, and so on. So let us start with the forests. Ancient India had a close symbiotic relationship between people and nature because the country was thickly forested. Even the Indus Valley seas showed tiger and rhinoceros and elephant, which means Punjab would have been a thickly forested area. You can't even imagine uh, that there were such animals. But as late as Babar, I think he shot something like 40 rhinoceros, so an enormous number. They all went, shoot, went hunting in that area. So it was a very thickly forested area, which it no longer is. Forests were places of retreat, a source of inspiration, for all Vedic literature was revealed to the sages in the forests. The Aranyakas, which is the earlier section of the Vedas, are philosophical speculations. Aranyaka may be defined as produced by or relating to the forest or belonging to the forest. They were composed by sales, sages living in the forest. One of the most beautiful hymns of the Rig Veda is de dedicated to Aranyani, the goddess of the forest. Aranyani never returns in later Sanskrit literature or modern Hinduism. In fact, it is very perplexing that we never hear of her again. But her spirit pervades the goddesses of Hinduism, Prakriti or, or nature, Bhu, Bhu Devi, the earth goddess, Annapurna, the giver of food, Amman in Tamil Nadu, Born Bibi in Bengal, and so on. Now in the Vedas, there were three categories of forest. The Tapovan was a refuge for meditation, an Abhyaranya or sanctuary, where kings and commoners sought the guidance of sages. The Mahavana was the great forest in which all species could find refuge. And the Shrivana was the forest which pr provided prosperity, what we would call revenue uh, giving forests. Shri, as you know, is prosperity, Lakshmi. It was maintained by temples and set aside exclusively for religious use. Now, Rama's journey from Ayodhya to Lanka was through forests and is a botanist's delight. In fact, a few years ago, I sent two of my scientists to all the sites of Rama's travel through India. And it's amazing how every plant that Valmiki mentions and every animal are still found there, including one statement as he enters Dandakaranya. Bharadwaja says, be careful, 
there are lions and tigers there and today one cannot imagine lions in uh, the Dandakaranya region there are only tigers but there in Bhimbetka I saw a painting of a lion and a tiger so it's amazing so Rama stays in four forests Chitrakut a deciduous forest Dandakaranya near Bhimbetka in Madhya Pradesh also a deciduous forest Panchavati, a tropical dry deciduous forest. Pancha is fine. Bata is banyan tree. Panchavata. Kishkinda near Hampi, where the Vijayanagar Empire, which uh, built its capital, it's a dry and moist deciduous forest. Also, two others are mentioned Aushadi, which Hanuman carries and brings all the way to save the life of Lakshman in uh, Sri Lanka. And finally, the author describes the evergreen tropical forests of Lanka. The Arthashastra de describes the different uses of forest. The Mrigavana or forests of deer, Dravyavana or economic forest, Pakshivana for bird sanctuaries, Pashuvana for all animals, Vyalavana for wildlife, reserved primarily for tigers and predators, and Hastivana, a sanctuary for elephants. And then there's the Dravyavana, which is a source for forest produce, a revenue yielding forest. And the Arthashastra is brilliant. Deforestation and illicit tree felling was punished by Dea, Levi and Fine. Ecological balance was maintained by the appointment of forest managers. And there are even punishments if the forest management managers are corrupt. And the protection of different species of animals was an important duty of the state. These laws were followed till the 7th, 8th centuries, till North India went into a state of turmoil. Now let's go to the sacred groves. The tapovan of the Vedas lives on in the sacred groves of India. They are the home of every village practically in India, even in Maharashtra where the program is being hosted in Tamil Nadu where I live. Every village has its sacred grove and there is a separate name for it in each state. This is the home of the local flora and fauna, a mini biosphere reserve. The rich plant life in each grove retains the subsoil water. It's a unique form of biodiversity conservation whereby religion and tradition are used to conserve the ecology as a natural heritage. An area of, it's an area of conservation as well as a spiritual retreat because people go there to meditate, to pray, and also to just have a lot of fun. This, this is the single most important heritage of the ancient culture of India. It's something which we have fortunately left alone for a long time. The tradition goes back to ancient food gathering societies who venerated nature and natural resources. Their significant reservoirs of biodiversity, conserving unique species of plants, insects, and animals. From time to time, in fact, we get reports that this unknown plant was discovered in this sacred forest, and it's generally in Kerala, in fact, in some uh, frog species, lizard species, and so on. And in fact, this is the one of the sacred uh, groves in Kerala. They've discovered a a miraculous, I would call it, rejuvenating plant. So things keep dis appearing, being discovered in these sacred groves. Now, most sacred groves all over India are dedicated to the mother goddess, who is Bhudevi, the goddess of the earth, and occasionally to a male god, like Ayanar in Tamil Nadu is a male deity. Now, what is their ex ecological uh, significance? They conserve, sorry, conservation of biodiversity is a major uh, part of the work of the sacred grove. The sacred groves are repositories of floral and faunal diversity that have been conserved by local communities. They are often the last refuge of endemic species in a geographic region. The grove also recharges the aquifers because there are, there's generally a pond or a stream or a spring inside the grove which supports the water requirements of the local people. 
It may not be enough to give them wat enough water to drink and for irrigation, but it maintains the water table. The vegetative cover helps in recharging aquifers and the vegetation cover of the sacred groves improves the soil stability of the area and prevents soil erosion. It's interesting to note that many towns and villages in India were and still are named after plants and animals. For example, Vrindavanya Mathura is named after the Vrinda or Tulsi plant. Vrindavan, one means forest. In Chennai, we have a suburb called Mailapur. Mail, Mail means peacock. Pur, Ur is the town of peacocks. I can go on. I can just go on listing these. You'll find them all over India. Now, the degree of sanctity according to a grove varies. In some forests, even dry foliage and fruits cannot be touched. People believe that any kind of disturbance will offend the local deity cause disease, natural calamities, or crop failure. The Garo and Khasi tribes of Northeast India prohibit human interference in these groves. In some places, dead wood or dry leaves may be picked up to cook the prasad during a festival, which can only come one day in a year. The live tree or its branches are never cut. In central India, the Gonds prohibit the cutting of a tree, but allow fallen paths to be used. It, each grove, each Society has its own rules. But what is amazing is that even children are not permitted to urinate or anything in a sacred grove out of respect and in for, out of respect for and in fear of the deities within. I saw this when I went and visited some sacred groves in Japan. They have the same rules and they're equally strict. And I'm amazed how India, you know, we are not very careful about what we do in public and in private, but in a sacred grove, there is absolutely no disturbance. It's quite amazing. Medicinal plants are preserved in the sacred groves and may be accessed during an illness or disease. Who are the protectors of the grove? That's very important. The groves belong to the local deity, generally the mother goddess. Gifts of terracotta animals, generally a horse, are given to aid the goddess as she roams around the village at night. Now, or Ayanar may be going around the village, whoever is the deity. But, she, but these are votive offerings which to prevent disease and disaster from entering the village. And they are votive offerings of thanks, a child who fell ill and recovered and so on. This again is an all India phenomenon, whether you call it the, or the Bankura horses of Bengal or any part of India, you have this tradition of giving terracotta animals, especially the horse, to as a votive offering to the deity. The gods of the groves can be grouped as under gods of rain and fertility, boundary gods, protectors, Kali, hero stones, snake stones. Snake stones you generally see in Kerala, but also in parts of Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. So here are some images. Right on top is a twin, is a play is Putupet, just outside Pondicherry in Tamil Nadu, and each horse is about 20 feet high. It's a be they're beautifully built. On the other side, we have the groves and the gods in Virupuram, and I chose this because there are no terracotta horses over here, but you will see a lot of uh, deities, and in the middle are the Virans, that is the braves who protect the forest. Bottom left, you have the Paikapan of Saturli in Goa. Now here you have a whole bunch of horses and there are even a couple of bulls in this uh, group. And I, I show you this because this is how, it, how common this is all over the country. And the last picture is a Sarpakavu. In Kerala, each family has a kavu or so sacred grove dedicated to the snake, sarpa. But of course, when you talk of development and the growth of cities, all these kavus are disappearing. Here I'd like to become uh, go into what we have done, which I think was important. We have documented over 10,000 sacred groves with the help of scientists and NGO. And we helped an NGO in Rajasthan restore orans, as sacred groves are called over there. 
we are the first organization in india take up to take up the restoration of sacred groves which we took up in 1993 and we till date we have restored 53 go groves in tamil nadu karnataka and andhra pradesh one well our chairman is dr ms swaminathan and he said how long are you going to restore groves create a new one and show me so we created a grove at nenmeli in kanchipuram district and it's amazing the way just because there was one little temple there was nothing over there it was wasteland but there was a little temple of a goddess so surrounding her we created this grove and right through the year there is water in what was once a wasteland in fact in all these groves what is amazing is the maintenance of the water table due to the trees the return of wildlife and by wildlife i mean anything from foxes hedgehogs of course varieties of birds but in a couple of groves they've even got back predators leopards we managed to get sacred groves included in the national biodiversity act we prepared a sacred grove management plan for the government of tamil nadu and the sacred grove ecosystem service assessment of the inland plains of tamil nadu for the ministry of environment and forests ecological studies of sacred groves in five agro climatic zones was taken up we influenced the kerala government to give 10000 per sarpa kavu for its maintenance because the kavus are just disappearing over there as families break up and properties become smaller earlier it was matrilineal and the entire property was maintained as one but now each child wants his or her share of the property and finally we produced a film on sacred groves called vanadevate so this is a map to give you some idea about the groves and they found all over the country but the abundance is along the west coast and in the northeast but although there has been no comprehensive study experts have estimated that the total number especially professor malhotra he says that the total number of groves in india could range from 100000 to 150000 but they are all under threat why disappearance of tradition traditional belief systems people think it is something primitive not worth not worth believing in any more so on urbanization development activities and encroachment that beautiful uh, first picture i showed you of the sacred grove just outside pondicherry in pavapattu uh, they have built a road through the grove so there goes all these beautiful old trees changing forms of worship now people want temples big temples with gopurams and vimanas and so on religious conversion this is a big problem in northeast because as communities become christian they are abandoning the groves which are just um, being misused the trees are being cut and the wood is uh, is sold off then of course invasion of exotic species and pressures due to increased livestock and fuel wood collection now another after now that we have seen the groves let's go to the other various forms of sacred ecology the nandavanam or the gardens which are maintained to provide flowers for the temple ritual they are also places for meditation and healing for people who want to go to the temple and just meditate for some time and fruit fruit and flowering trees are planted over here near the tanks so there are several and every temple generally has a little garden some have beautiful gardens and these are all described in sanskrit texts very often the divine place or the leelas of hindu deities like especially krishna they are depicted in they are depicted in nandavanams but this gardens were also gardens a place of meditation and healing and indian monasteries monasteries in india still have attractive gardens attached to them in fact hyun sang when he visited several monasteries all over the country he describes the beautiful garden gardens around them then you have the bag of the kicha which has utility trees and are planted near tanks but while there is a temple or space dedicated to the gods nearby they are not um, used 
necessarily for the worship in the temple, the plants in the bag. Now, we, right to the beginning, I showed you that the earliest form of worship was the plant, and it was the pipal tree. And we saw tree worship on so much, so much tree worship. I could have shown you many, many more trees. And uh, the tulsi, we continue to worship because it's generally good for our general health. The pipal for its air purifying and oxygen producing qualities. We worship rice, who is goddess Annapurna. But then we don't worship the tree anymore. What happened to the trees? Now, firstly, long before temples were built, the deity was kept under a tree. And once some ruler or rich benefactor came and offered to build a temple, what happens to the tree? So the trees were protected and these became the sthalavrikshas. The sthalavrikshas are the trees that first shelter the deity beneath the skies and were later replaced by temples. In fact, if you go to Vaidishwar and Koval near Kumbakonam, you will see the original Shiva Linga under the Meem tree. And uh, the present huge Linga is built much later in the Chola period. Why go that far? Even in Chennai, the original uh, Kapalishwar Lingam was with the peacock, was actually under an Alexandrian laurel tree, which is still there in the garden. But a new big Shiva Linga was built and it's in the Sanctum Sanctorum today. So the sacred tree becomes secondary. It's worshipped as the Sthala Vriksha of the temple and becomes a part of the faith and the ritual. It's no longer the primary object of worship. Now plants were always sacred because there are several reasons. There's a close association with the deity. For example, the Bilva for with Shiva, the Neem with the goddess, Tulsi with Krishna, some trees shelter an object of worship like a deity, a fetish or an attribute. Some plants are believed to have originated from bodies of the gods, hence their sanctity. For example, the flame of the forest, Butia monosperma, is believed to have originated from Lord Brahma himself. And the Rudraksha, Eliocarpus canitris, rose from the tears of Lord Shiva. Some plants became sacred through what might have occurred in their proximity. Example, the pipal under which Gautam Buddha attained enlightenment. And plants with an important social or economic or major ecological role are considered sacred. Like the veneration of the Kejarli by the Bishnois of Rajasthan is related to the important role it plays in desert ecology. It provides the community with food, fodder and building material. In Chennai, where I live, we have the Kapalishwar temple and the Sthalavriksha there is the Alexandrian, Alexandrian laurel or Pune. And the importance of the tree is because once upon a time, the ships which sailed to Southeast Asia with the traders were made of this tree. So it has a very important economic role. So ancient Indians knew about the ecological value of plants, the medicinal value of plants, the economic value of plants, and protected them by making them sacred. I just want to mention one more thing over here, and that is pollution. Because it is in a way related with the plant, pollution was once a punishable offense. As you can see, Kautilya says that a punishment must be awarded to those who throw dust and muddy water on the roads, person who throws carcass of animals inside the city. I don't know what he would say if he saw, saw the way we throw plastic around today. The Mahabharata says that environmental pollution of Vikriti was identified several millennia ago and causes two types of diseases in human beings, first related to the body and other to the mind. And finally, Charaka was prescient when he predicted due to pollution of weather, several types of diseases will come up and they will ruin the country. Therefore, we are in that situation, my friends. Therefore, collect the medicinal plants before the beginning of terrible diseases and change in the nature of the earth. 
I cannot think of anything more prescient than that. The other sacred part of our ecology are the waters. And I don't have to tell you about the importance of water. All, almost all rivers, lakes, and springs are associated with a local pantheon of gods and goddesses. Most Indian rivers are divine manifestations and rivers have been worshipped as goddesses. Some like Brahmaputra are male and polluting water is a great sin according to Sanskrit texts. So let us all know that if we really want good karma, we should do something about polluting our rivers. Now, say the sacred rivers Ganga, were the Sapta Sindhavi originally praised in the Rig Veda, in the Nadi Stuti Sukta. But today the seven Sindhu to Saraswati are barely in India. So Ganga, Yamuna, Saraswati, Godavari, Narmada, Kaveri, Brahmaputra is what we worship in our in the course of our rituals. And all local rivers, including the uh, small town rivers, are identified with Ganga. So they, are, they appear as deities and each river has an origin myth to establish her sanctity. Pilgrimage sites are found along river banks and the word Tirtha, which means sacred or a sacred pilgrimage site, came to mean, which came to mean water itself. So there are sacred lakes, natural lakes like Mansarovar, artificial lakes like Pushkar, step wells like the Bhav, the temple tanks of South India. Desilting these is a duty, a dharma, and the entire village would participate in summer. The silt from these lakes were used to make the clay figures of deities. Ganesh, Chaturthi, Durga Puja were made from the desilted mud of all these lakes. And they were never baked. At the end of the festival, the whole idea of putting it back is because it goes back into the water. Now, of course, it's baked and it's just polluting the seas, the rivers and the lakes. Temple tanks are a very important part of our culture. They are rainwater harvesting structures. They maintain the groundwater table and they cannot be touched or misused. They are the only water source during a drought. They are medicinal because the herbal Abhisheka Jalam, that is the Abhishek water, goes into the tanks. And they support a variety of life forms. They are maintained by temples. I believe that this tradition goes back to the Indus Valley civilization because the great tank that we see, the, it's called the Great Bath. You know, we are not really a great uh, community of swimmers in India. I don't think people went for public bathing. I'm quite sure that that was a tank and people keep talking about those little alcoves around it. Well, here's a temple in Karnataka, the Bhoga Nandishwara temple, which has the same little alcoves, which you could, if you want, pass off as little changing rooms, but they aren't. This is a Rani Ki Vav temple, which is, I think, a World Heritage Site today. Then we come to sacred animals. India's greatest contribution to world thought is the concept of ahimsa, or non-violence, in thought, word, and action. Killing animals has been prohibited since the Vedic period. And the Yajurveda says, no person should kill animals who are helpful to all. By serving them, one should obtain heaven. The term ahimsa is a very important spiritual doctrine shared by Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism which applies the total avoidance of harm to any living creature. Ahimsa is a multi-dimensional concept inspired by the belief that the supreme being lives in all living beings, human or animal. Therefore, to hurt another is to open oneself to possible karmic repercussions. That is, you may be reborn as the rat whom you killed or whatever. Now, Ahimsa is first mentioned in the Rig Veda and the Taitriya Shaka of the Yajur Veda, but the earliest reference to the idea of non-violence towards animals or Pashu Ahimsa is to be seen in the Kapistala Katha Samhita of the Yajur Veda. The Chandogya Upanishad uses Ahimsa as a code of conduct. It bars violence against all creatures, Sarva Bhuta, and the practitioner of Ahimsa is said to escape from the cycle of rebirth. 
so the hindu sub belief hindu uh, belief in the cycle of birth death and rebirth requires people to give all species equal respect and reverence for himsa may result in their rebirth as an animal bird or insect in another life and go through the suffering which they cause in this life this again is a continuous part of indian civilization in the indus seals among the indus seals we have this wonderful figure the lord of animals he is surrounded by a rhinoceros a bull a buffalo a tiger and an elephant now who could this be i think he is three faced he is sitting in a yogic position is this pashupati a form of shiva even beneath him there are two more animal figures interestingly the rigveda probably had the world's first vegan and i brought this to because today bekam being sorry being re- vegan is very fashionable the yathudana who fills himself oh sorry why well, i wish this can be removed mm. uh who fills himself with the flesh of horses or other animals and he who steals the milk of the cow lord cut off their heads with your flame and the earth was created for the enjoyment so enjoyment of bipeds and quadrupeds and all other creatures not humans alone says atharva veda and the chandogya upanishad has violence against all creatures while the practitioner of ahimsa is said to escape from the cycle of birth death and rebirth and i must mention a very important book written around 200 between 400 and 200 bc the tirukkural in tamil which dedicates an entire book the aram or dharma uh, section called dharma aram is dedicated to the virtues of compassion and ahimsa to vegetarianism and the non harming of animals and non killing of all life forms in fact the whole book was written on this as early as that period in tamil so how were animals given sanctity some were gods themselves oops why is this changing some were gods themselves like ganesha or vagdev the tiger god also called huli raya in maharashtra and karnataka now the elephant is a keystone species was the remover of obstacles ganesha is vigneshwara the remain remover of obstacles the tiger bhagdev or huli raya was the top predator and prime ecological indicator some like hanuman and the dog were man's friends therefore primates and dogs as bhairava were protected the four first four avatars of vishnu matsya ko the fish the tortoise boar and narasimha the lion were avatars or indications of vishnu and they were they were also the vehicles in fact many many birds animals are the vehicles of the gods here we see garuda upon whom is seated vishnu with shri devi bhu devi this is a painting by ravi varma on the other side we see a beautiful sculpture of durga on the lion and she is fighting the buffalo god mahisha now mahisha apart from the lion being her vehicle mahisha is a very interesting character some animals of course were essential for the economy like the cow was essential for milk the bull was a bra- draft animal and the black buck was essential for the survival of the kejarli plant but some animals were a part of social history mahisha the buffalo vehicle of yama was the deity of ancient india of the pastoral tribes and many kingdoms were named after him such as mysore which is actually come which comes from the word mahisha ur mahishur mahishur and mahishmati in central india now the buffalo was worshiped by the indigenous pastoral tribes of india and the war between mahisha and durga replicates the go- conflict between the buffalo worshiping pastoral tribes and dravidian agriculturists who worshiped the mother goddess when the agriculturists won the buffalo became a demon but mahisha still lives on as the buffalo god of tribal india the todas the gonds maria gonds for them she, he is the deity he is their deity he is masoba in maharashtra bhesa surin 
Madhya Pradesh. So by recognizing the divinity in animals, they were given a unique, unique position which helped protect many species. So, um, I'm going to now be a little faster because we must wind up. There are three paths to liberation and a hum while a human consciously chooses his path, animals too can rise above the limitations of, the birth, of their birth and attain liberation. Medieval saints preached kindness to animals and Guru Jamboji died leaving behind guide, guiding principles for his community and said he would be reborn in every black buck. Finally, the sacred mountains. Hindus look up to the Himalayas as the source of sacred rivers, such as the Ganga. Um, they are comprehensive ecosystems. By revering mountains and sacred sites within the mountains, communities have maintained and preserved their natural resources. The mountains highlight values and, and ideals that influence how people view and treat each other. Some mountains may be associated with individual deities and saints like Govardhan at Vrindavan for its association with Krishna and hence its sanctity. But some are revered as places of spiritual attainment like Kailasa in Tibet, Arunachala in Thiruvannamalai, Thirumala in Andhra Pradesh, better known as Tirupati, but Tirupati is actually at the foothill. Mukurti Peak in Nilgiris is a sacred hill of the Toda tribe. And you'll be interested to know that our temples are built on the concept of Mount Meru. And it is mythical, but it is the epitome of the sacred, the most sacred mountain. And the best example is Angkor Wat in Cambodia with its five spires representing the five, five peaks. The original seven walls were symbolic of seven continents and it was interspersed with moats that represented the oceans. Meru sits on Jambudvipa, the Earth's landmass, to the south of which is Bharatavarsha. Finally, we had the seeds which are closely connected with culture. They are a symbol of fertility, eternity and sustenance. And women play a major role in their conserve, conservation. They decide on the seeds to be preserved, the methods, conservation and propagation. On the day of sowing, women keep the seeds before the house deity and worship them. Interestingly, this is never done for modern high yielding varieties. Before sowing begins, women worship draft animals, the plough and other equipments. And seeds play an important role in Indian rituals like the Navadhanya. So conserving seeds is conserving biodiversity, conserving knowledge of the seed and its utilization and conserving culture and sustainability. So finally, the sacred ecology is a uniquely Indian concept. Ecological traditions are pan-Indian. They are celebrated all over India. So when the British say that they, real, they created India, did they? The commonality of our culture suggests otherwise. Just a few examples. Look at our festivals, harvest. We have Bhogi and Pongal in Tamil Nadu, Lohri in Punjab, Bihu in Assam. At the same time, three different corners of the country celebrating the same harvest festival. Fire is worshipped all through the country during Deepavali, Diwali and Kartike Deepa. Flowers are, are uh, worshipped during Onam, Batukamma in Telangana. So human beings share the earth with animals and other, uh, other creations of nature. The Atharva says it is up, Atharva Veda says it is up to us, the progeny of Mother Earth, to live in peace and harmony with all the others. The divine is all and all life must be treated with reverence and respect. Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the family of Mother Earth, must promote Sarva Bhuta Hita, the welfare of all beings. If forests and trees, fresh water and clean air disappear, says the Durga Shati. So will all life on earth. And in order to be sustainable over the long term, environmental policies and programs need to take values and ideals into account. Otherwise, they will fail to en enlist local and popular support that they need to succeed. 
At the beginning and end of every ritual, a Shanti mantra is recited. May peace radiate in the whole sky and in the ethereal space. May peace, peace reign all over the earth in water, in herbs and in the forests. May peace flow over all the whole universe. May peace be in the Supreme Being. May peace exist in all creation and peace alone. May peace flow into us. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. I'd like to just end with a small uh, quotation from a judge, Justice Vaidyanathan, who in the course of uh, making an observing while observation while disposing of a writ petition filed by the owner of a commercial building said, our tradition and values passed down to us from our ancestors are not wrong beliefs. They're scientific, rational and logical. That is why they worship nature. Even now, many of them who follow our ancestral beliefs continue to do so as they have abundant sanctity. Referring to people worshipping soil, fire, water, space and air, the Pancha Mahabhuta, the learned judge said, it is not at all irrational. When nature gets sanctity, it will not be ruined. Thus, nature was protected in those days. However, in the name of rationality, religious taboos were violated the result of which we suffer these days. I really wish we could hear more such statements. For uh, If you are interested in more of this, you are most welcome to visit our website, cpreecenvis.mic.in. Uh, it is a part of the ministry's uh, ENVIS, Environmental Information S uh, Systems Pro Program, and uh, we have documented as much as we can of the ecological heritage and sacred sites of India. I have written three books, Sacred Animals of India, India, Sacred Plants of India and Hinduism and Nature. And you can also read them to know more. Thank you very much for your patience and for listening to me. Thank you.